my very first experience with major regulatory changes, I was pursuing a traditional academic track earlier in my career after fellowship and residency. I intended to be an academic internist. Um, and part of how my own career got changed is that I found out how much you could get done um, to help people in other kinds of ways. And um, the, the experience that was life-changing for me was making needle exchange happen in San Francisco in 1992. So I want to tell you a little bit about that. So these are um, the hard years of the AIDS epidemic. Uh, no place was harder hit um, than San Francisco um, in the 90s. Uh, very high rates of death among previously healthy people. Uh, at the time, we don't have very good treatments. We don't have very good ways to prevent HIV. But we have a very interesting observation. And the observation is that cities that have needle exchange programs, like San Francisco and Seattle and some of the Western European countries, like Amsterdam, had low rates of uh, HIV infection among drug users. And places like Newark, New York City, Miami, without needle exchange programs, had much higher rates of infection among injection drug users. And so here we had what was a known thing to work, right? That is to say, if you gave someone a clean needle, they would use a clean needle. Um, need having a clean needle doesn't change whether someone's an addict or not. If they're going to shoot up, they're going to shoot up. But it would make a difference in whether they would become infected, whether their sexual partner would become infected, whether they would have an infected child. The problem I had as someone working in the health department is the California law prohibited syringes from being dispensed except with a doctor's prescription. So, San Francisco had a small underground program that was running illegally by giving out these needles, but I couldn't fund it because how can you fund something that's illegal? Generally, the answer is you can't. But it is not unusual that you can find a rule or a law that's sort of counter to the one you think you're trying to deal with. And so I've learned to look for those things. It turned out that state law allows counties to suspend laws in cases of public health emergency. Now, what was meant by this was an earthquake, you know, something like Hurricane Sandy, right? You understand that governments have rules about, you know, who can, you know, rent a bulldozer, right? You need tree falls in front of your house, right? You need the tree removed. Generally, you know, you can't just have anyone remove the tree if it's a county function. You have to go with who has the contract. Well, in a natural emergency, you need a way to say, forget those contracts. We just need, you know, every bulldozer here to help us after Hurricane Sandy. So that was what the intention was of this. But I'm looking at it and thinking, well, this is a public health emergency. In fact, AIDS at this time is the, the number one cause of death. Um, in, among men in San Francisco, right? So um, we worked for our board of supervisors to declare a public health emergency. I got the mayor to sign the bill, which wasn't easy because our county council wrote an opinion that said that by us all signing, we not only could be arrested, but those elected officials could be prohibited from running for future office. Now, it's one thing to tell a politician that he may be arrested, but to tell a politician that he may be prohibited from future office, that's really, you know, asking them a lot. But we had a lot of support. Needle Exchange was funded, 1992. The, because we did it under this emergency order, the board had to keep renewing its public health emergency every two weeks for nine years. <laughs> 